Okay guys, it's eight o'clock London time. First, before I say anything else, I'm gonna to try to keep the dogs quiet because they're making an awful lot of noise. But thanks so much for being on our channel. Please take the dogs out, Laurie. Sorry, slight hiccup here. Take them out, go. So, we are so grateful to have so many followers on this channel. It's absolutely amazing. We need more, so please spread the word because the more followers we get, the more awareness we can create and the more people will help save and protect wildlife. Um, we've got lots of questions lined up. We've got stuff coming on now. So I'm just gonna kick off. My team are gonna feed me questions, um, either live ones as you're saying them now or stuff that we've got earlier on. Um, if you catch me out, I shall either start to sweat a lot or just run out the door. So great to hear, it's a pity I can't see your faces, it's a pity we can't communicate together. It's sort of like doing a very silent radio show. But we're here, we're ready. Let's go with the first question. Cool, so the first question that we've got, which a number of people have asked, is how did you start Wildlife Aid? By mistake, absolute mistake. Uh, I started it, it was a little hobby. It was nothing more, I had a very pressurized job in the city and I used to come home very late in the evenings and at weekends I just needed to unwind and lose myself in something else. Um, and we started with a seagull. So I could keep all these answers, I can talk about this for about an hour, I'm gonna keep these answers really short and sweet, but if you want more to these answers, come on later on and ask us and we'll do it offline or either that, or we'll do another one of these when you want one. So just let us know how you're enjoying it. Cool, so uh, Michelle Topham has asked, where does the income for Wildlife Aid come from? Are you government funded or is it just public donations? I worked in the city for 23 years, you start a company, you get a good product, you make more of the product, you make more money, you make bigger profit. So the better you do, the more you make. Charities, it's a nightmare. Never, never start a charity because the more successful you are, the more money you need to raise. So actually your success is your downfall financially. Um, we're not funded by anybody apart from the public. So the YouTube channels are really important to us. Your donations are desperately important to us. And obviously the dreaded word legacies. Legacies are so important because any big charity only gets big because of legacies. So that's really important. So it's not funded by anybody apart from you out there, which is so, so, so important to us. Give me another question, Mr. Braley. So, uh, Kathy has asked, are you on call 24-7? Um, Laurie is on call 24-7. He's my media man. I will get him to stick his face in front of the camera in a minute so you can just see how ugly he is. But we are on call 24-7. We love it. Um, it was much easier when I was in my 30s than it is now I'm in my 60s. Um, so, yeah, we're always here. If we get a call, we'll go. We promise not to tonight. We've got people on standby tonight in case something comes in while we're chatting to you. Um, a number of people have asked, where are we based? Have we got centres around the UK or is it just here? We are based in Leatherhead in Surrey, which is just at the bottom of the M25, for those of you in England. Uh, for those of you not in England, we're sort of in the southeast, right in the middle, just below London. Um, we have one centre. Uh, we've always hit way, way above our weight because of the TV series that ran for 16 years on television and people thought we were massive and we had millions of pounds and and I was very handsome, but I've got older since then. Um, but no, we're just here, one centre. This is what we do, this is where we are. Uh, so, a number of people have actually asked from the, one of our recent videos, how is your rib? <laughs> it hurts, it really hurts. Um, it was fine the day I did it, and the day after I did it, and suddenly I woke up the next morning, I thought, ooh, hurts a bit and I had to go to the doctor for something else, and I said, I think I might have done some damage here. He said, yeah, it's cracked. So it's getting better, it's gonna take 12 weeks, so we'll see how it goes, but I can still do the rescues, nothing will stop me. <laughs> so, uh, once again, a couple of people have asked this one. Uh, why did you start WAF in the first place? What was that first patient? I'd like to say I started WAF because it was advanced senility, but that's only happened recently. Um, I have a passion for animals, I have a passion for the wild, I have a passion for nature. Um, I had done a job for 23 years in the city, which is about as far as away you can get from where I wanted to be. I come from a farming family, or, or my relations farm. Um, so I started because I loved it, but it was a little hobby. It was gonna be nothing bigger when I started it than just doing something at the weekends to make a difference. And my media team haven't turned their phones off and they are gonna get severely bead when I come off the screen. <laughs> off we go, come on media team. 
Uh, so, Mama has asked, uh, what are the steps in setting up a wildlife rescue? How difficult is it? <laughs> I've no idea. You just start it and it all goes wrong and you get bigger and you have to raise more money and then you do more rescues and then you have to raise some more money and then you get more staff. It, it's, it's, ha it's how it, it gets as big as you want to make it, basically. When you start, it can be very small. You can actually start with just a box, a, a grasper and, and a shed, which is how we started. We started in the kitchen of my house and then from there it developed to just a little, uh, I think it was a, an eight by four shed. I mean, tiny when we started. We had one drug and that was teramycin, that was in a little pot. Um, and then of course it's just grown exponentially over the years. So uh, it starts by accident. Um, would I start it again now? If I was in my thirties maybe, but at my age, definitely not. So uh, Jason has asked, what's your most memorable rescue? That's going to be a difficult one. It's impossible. Um, memorable rescues, every rescue is memorable because if you think if you're going for a wild animal, you get one chance at rescuing it. So it could be in a not a too dangerous situation or a dangerous situation, but if you get it wrong, it becomes horrendous and out of control. So <clears throat> I suppose the most dangerous rescue I can think of is a deer that had gone down 10 foot down into a little well. The well was only nine inches wide, so we couldn't get down in there. Um, and we had to make a actually invent a special lasso system to get him out. And we had one chance of that, because if it had gone wrong, he would have fallen back down and broken himself to pieces. Um, so that was very, very tense for us, a very tense rescue. It's somewhere in our footage, but uh, who knows? We've got so much footage over so many years, and I hate watching it because I look so much younger when I started. <laughs> so uh, Joyce Wu has asked, what skills do you need to be a wildlife rescuer? Insanity. That's what you need to be a wildlife rescuer, insanity. Um, seriously, I started knowing nothing. I, I had no idea what I was doing when I started. I think a lot of it is instinct. People say, will you write a book on how you rescue animals? I think deep down, you've got to have an instinct for it. You've, you've got to just feel and maybe think as the animal thinks. You've got to work out what the animal's likely to do, how scared it's going to be, what's going to happen. Um, so a lot of it's gut instinct. If, ever you, if you do rescue animals and you've ever got a question afterwards, I mean, lots of stuff on our YouTube channel you can look at how we approach things, but every single rescue is different. No two have ever been exactly the same. Cool. Um, a couple of people say, is there a site to buy WAF merchandise or anything from there? We have a website which is quite educational. It's got an awful lot of FAQs on it, a lot of information about wildlife in Britain, that is, obviously. Uh, there's a site where you can buy things. That's obviously important. We don't make an awful lot from our merchandise. Obviously, donations are far more important to me. You'll hear probably over the hour that we talk tonight that I'm continually talking about money and it's a question I always get asked when I do talks and everybody says, when I say, oh, it's all about the money, they get all cross and it should be about the animals. It's actually about the money because if we had the money, we could do more animals. So we're dedicated and passionate about what we do, but with the money, we could do so much more. So I will keep harping on about money. I don't apologize because that's what makes us successful and why we've been here 39 years and are still going reasonably strong apart from my body which is not quite so strong as it used to be. <clears throat> so, um, Gerby, and I apologise if I've butchered that name, uh, has asked, why are there so few hedgehogs left in the UK? Mankind. Don't get me on that topic because I can talk about that for at least three hours. I get on a podium and I just say the most invasive species on this planet is mankind which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, there are so few because we have more roads, we have more pesticides, we have less hedgerows. Everything really that we get in, 95% of the patients we get in, are because mankind is involved in some way, either because, you know, wantonly or by mistake. So wildlife's really struggling, it's losing its habitat, it's losing its food source, so many things are going wrong. Hedgehogs have gone from 30 million down to a million today, and we want to try to address that balance. We want to try to get the numbers of all our wildlife back. Actually, anybody says, you know, which is the most important animal, because so many people sponsor the big animals, the giraffes and the tigers and the elephants and all the big things. But actually, if you think about it very deep down, it's the food chain that makes everything work. So if you lose all the lower end of the food chain, then the higher end of the food chain will disappear as well, including us. So everything has its place in this planet, possibly apart from man with the overpopulation, but that's a whole nother subject. So, um, he says so, every question he says so, it I starts really so. annoying, <laughs> really annoying. So. 
that this is why I'm behind the camera. Go on, keep going, keep going, keep going. Sir Time's Clark passing. has asked, would you like to see wolves reintroduced in the UK? It's very difficult. I would obviously wish wolves and lynx and all the animals hadn't actually been taken away because it ruined the food chain. I keep going back on that as well because nature works. Nature's very clever um, and it's very forgiving. But what it can't do is deal with things as fast as we're pushing the problems to it. So it takes time to catch up. If we still had wolves and lynx, we wouldn't have an overpopulation of deer because everything would be in balance. Whether we could do that now with the population that we have and the increased rows and everything else, I don't know. Yes, I'd love to see them because I love wolves. I've still got a scratch on my nose from a wolf in Russia many years ago. Um, I think really what we should be doing is concentrating on what we've got now and trying to pres preserve that rather than trying to do all these mega, mega things, which is probably asking too much. So, uh, we've actually had a couple of people donate whilst we've been on air. So You're lovely. I love those people. Have you got their names? Yep, so Blue Girl Friday is donated. Blue Girl Friday, you are amazing. And has said, God bless Simon and the team. God bless the team. It's not me. I'm just one of 350 people. Yeah, I sort of be there and annoy everybody all day and get very bad tempered and swear a lot. Um, there's a few bets tonight that at some point during this program I will swear. I will do my best not to. I actually did a radio show for two years and didn't swear once. So thank you to you. Who else donated? Mm -hmm. uh, Aisha donated five pounds and has asked, what's the saddest thing that's happened while saving an animal? Aisha, thank you. Um, the saddest thing that's happened, I was going to say, is Laurie, who's my media man. Um, He's really. a lovely man to work with. He's very on. sad. Uh, the saddest thing is when you try to rescue an animal and it dies before you can actually get it out or something happens. I mean, we don't get to rescue an animal unless it's in big trouble. No wild animal is going to come that close to you unless it's got no choice and it can't escape. Um, very rarely you'll get an animal and it'll die as you get it out. I think the saddest thing is when you get an animal out, an animal out and you've worked for probably one or two hours to get it back here and it dies when it gets here. That's pretty tragic to us, to be honest, and pretty tragic to me. It always affects me, still will. So, uh, a couple more donations. So, Patrick has donated £10 and has said, please can you wish his girlfriend, Anika, a happy birthday because she loves your channel. Happy birthday, Anisha. Thank Anika. you for the money. That's very... Anika. Anika. Yes. Um, that's very kind. I've just seen a message come up on the screen from Susan Blissett. Susan, we love you. We know you're not good, but look who you're married to. That's a very personal thing to Susan Blissett, who used to be my PA for many years. And then she left me, deserted me, and went off to Canada. So, love you. Love you, George, but in a manly sort of way. Keep going, Laurie. Uh, okay, so Lego La has just donated 20 US dollars and has said he's trying to follow your steps here in the USA and that you're an inspiration. Uh, I always get a bit choked by these sort of comments, and I should probably choke up a bit now. I mean, it's lovely that you follow us, <clears throat> but we do what we do. We're passionate about it. Do I care more about animals than people? Yes, yeah, sadly I do. But without you, we couldn't do what we do. So I'm glad I'm, I'm an inspiration. Even if you just go out and save one animal for the rest of your life, that's better than not saving anything. But anybody who wants to start off a wildlife sanctuary, you'll end up like me. Look at me, I'm only 26. And look, look, at, look at me, look at me. I'm a wreck. I'm a wreck. Keep going, man. Keep going, man. So, uh, a number of people have asked, what's your favourite animal? And I know you have an answer to this, and I know what you're going to answer. <laughs> I have lots of favourite animals, to be honest. I think the best thing I've ever done in my entire life was went on safari filming for Wildlife SOS and we went out to Zambia. And I spent the whole week crying because I was just so overawed at the beauty of, of, the, of nature without man interfering. It was just stunning. Favourite animal here? To be honest, I've got lots. Animals have different characters. Yes, I love the badgers. Yes, I love otters until they bite me. But everything's got a different character and not so much a favourite animal. It's just the personality of that animal, and animals have amazing personalities, and obviously they have great, great sentience. Uh, My so team are so slow here. It's, it, we'll have to do this again, guys, without the current team. We'll, we'll get a, a, a better sort of team running. We have this. to work with this man every You don't day. have to. You can leave. You can leave. What, take the Come on, keep off. going, keep going. Um, so, uh, Jessica said she's recently started at vet school. How can she focus on a career with wildlife? Huh. Um, we're getting more and more vets nowadays who are going through vet school and want to work entirely with wildlife. If you've gone to work vet school because you love animals, which I think some people still do, sadly I think some people go through vet school just because of the money, which is a bit tricky, but m no insult intended. If you work with wildlife, you ain't ever going to be rich. Sorry, you'll be rich in your spirit and in your soul, 
but you won't be rich financially. Um, there are centres all over the world that deal with wildlife, and if you can go and volunteer at one of those on your downtime, um, not very much time is spent on veterinary centres in the UK on wildlife. Very little bit of the curriculum is wildlife, so you need to up your skills by going to a wildlife hospital. There's quite a few in the UK, and there's quite a few all over the world. So just bully them, because I'm sure they would love, as we would, love to have more students in vet students, vet nurse students, because we rely on volunteers, 350 volunteers. I would love to get 350 vet students, vet nurse students here as well, because it would take the pressure off us a little bit and we could do more. I'm speaking very fast because we've got an awful lot to get through. So I've had those answers very tight and crisp answers, questions very tight and crisp for me, Mr. Brady. Otherwise uh, there's trouble. Mama has asked, what's your favorite part of the job? Uh, not working with Laurie. Is that alcohol or not alcohol? It's for me to know, you to never know. Um, my favourite part of the job, without any doubt, is the rescues. And close seconds to the releases, but I think to be able to go to an animal that is going to die if you don't get to it, is going to suffer in some way, and make that, reverse that situation to get it well, to get it back out, that's phenomenal. Rescue releases are my very favourite thing because you get an animal, you rescue it, nothing wrong with it, you can let it go. Without you, it wouldn't have got away. So it's the rescues. It, that is what floats my boat and always has for the entire time I've run the centre. Um, so we've had uh, an awful lot of donations that have come in recently. I love you so much. We're going to do this every single <laughs> night and we're going to do it for four hours a night. So Nikita, Peter, Vivalon and Promax have all donated really nice sums, all of which are saying that you're amazing, keep up the good work. I'm insane! Uh, I'm insane! Can you not see the insanity? It's there, deep down! <laughs> yes, go on, keep going, Laurie, keep uh, going. Tamar has asked, are we hiring? Can we get a job here, or is it just volunteer-based? I'm the meanest CEO you will ever meet. I don't hire anybody unless they say they're going to work for nothing. And then I'm really nice to them for a couple of hours. I can be so nice. Um, it's all about money. Again, it's all about money. I'd love to have 50 members of staff. I'd love to have a big fundraising team. I'd love to do lots of things. But we have to watch every single penny. And as we get bigger and do more, we have to be even more concerned about our cash flow because obviously we don't want to ever get to a point where we just have to stop because we've run out of money. I always insist on keeping at least a year's running cost in the bank because if something went horribly wrong, like Brexit or something like that, who said that word? Um, you know, I want enough money to get the patients that we've got through back into the wild. So, uh, we've got Dante who's asked, how many years has your organisation been around? And has asked, did we receive the German Christmas sweets? Which we did, and they were very, very nice. So thank you very much. I like to say I like them. I'd like to be, I'd like to lie to you. Any sweets come in here, I don't get to see them. The team are like gluttons. We've got a new girl with us, Abby, on our media team. She's like a bottomless pit for food. The office is full of biscuits and sweets and cakes. And, you know, she'll say to me, oh, we got those lovely sweets and didn't we? I said, I have no idea. Didn't see a thing. But thank you. Lovely thought. And the team did enjoy them. So, uh, Joe Cake Game Dev has asked, can you feed swans lettuce? Um, yes, you can. Not too much. Not too much of anything, really. Um, wildlife should, in the normal times of the year, not need food at all because there's plentiful supplies of food out there. I know the habitat's less, but they shouldn't need supplementary feed. But yes, you can. You can feed them greens of all sorts. You can buy swan pellets in shops, special swan pellets. Try not to feed them bread. If you're going to feed them bread at all, make it brown bread. But try to stay with what they naturally eat in the wild as near as you can. Really important. Keep going, Laurie. You're Peter, slowing down, man. Peter has asked, how much does getting smacked by a swan hurt? You're notorious for being beaten up by swans. Now, really, I should say, it's terribly painful and agonising. Sadly, swans are pussycats. Providing you handle them right and know what you're doing, it really doesn't hurt at all. You get a bit of a bruise sometimes. I've never been seriously hurt by an animal. The only time I got quite badly, well, quite hurt, was when a badger bit me. It was only a baby badger too. It bit me on the thumb and wouldn't let go for about five minutes. It felt like about five hours, and even I couldn't swear. I was sitting there saying, please let go. Please let go. It really hurts. And it did, and it took me six months to get the feeling back in that thumb, and it's still not totally back now. And I just had a message from Susan Blissett again. Don't overstay your welcome, Susan. You just control yourself out there. She says, get Ricky Gervais on board. Anybody knows him. He is a patron. 
I'm trying to get him on board. I'm trying to get him on board with our big new project, which is so big. I want to do it from my little wooden box and cart it out to a crematorium. Um, if you're listening, Ricky, if you're watching, Ricky, speak to me. I'm old. I deserve it. Thank you. So we've had a number of people ask, just going down that route, uh, do you have any plans to expand the centre? Massive plans, huge plans. We've got a plan going at the moment after 39 years, which is actually scares me to death. The plan didn't when I started drawing it up. It's now going to do so much more. It'll take the centre to a whole new level uh, with teaching and education and inspiring children to understand the food chain, which is one of my favourite words, um, and also nature and how everything has to be in place for everything to work. So massive plans. Hopefully within the next, I would think, couple of months, you'll see all this stuff. It's called 20 Acres. It's our legacy project. It should appear on the website very, very shortly. Um, and it's big. It is so big. If I wasn't so senile, I'd be scared. So Lucy, who you may remember, has asked, why does your office look so tidy suddenly? I can't talk to Lucy Kells. I won't talk to Lucy Kells. She was our vet nurse. She was a very good vet nurse for some years. And then she left us. She is a non-person. She is gone. She's retired. She's swanning around the country like a prima donna. In fact, I was swanning around Europe, actually. Uh, miss you, Luce. Um, what did she ask? <laughs> so why is your office suddenly so tidy? Because I'm sitting at Laurie's desk. <laughs> not, my desk is a heap. It's horrible. So I'm sitting at Laurie's desk. You can tell he does no work at all, which is why it's so clean and tidy. Next question. Let's keep them going. So Renee has donated 25 US dollars. I love you, Renee. said that she loves your book. Which book's that? Is it the Owl book or the Wildlife? What's, what's my I, book I called? would guess My Wildlife. My Wildlife. That's me. That's My Wildlife, yeah. And I've done a children's book as well, which actually is far more me because it's written with seven-year-olds and that's all my brain can compute at. Um, my Wildlife. Glad you like it. It's a very um, abridged version of my life, really. All the stuff I wanted to put in, they just wouldn't let me. The lawyer said, you cannot write that, Simon. That would not be allowed. So it was cut from 140,000 words to 70,000 words. Very kindly and cleverly written by our PR guru, Nick Harding, who supports us in so many ways. I got to meet him through the book, and we've never let him go since. He now does all our PR and our journalism. So if any, anything goes wrong on our media side, it's his fault. Um, but yeah, glad you liked it, thanks. So we've got Catherine, who's just given us 10 pounds, and said, please can you wish her good luck in her final year at university? What she's studying? What's Catherine studying? You better type quickly, Catherine, but good luck, final year. Don't like what you do when you finish, come and work at Wildlife Aid for nothing. Be great, just win the lottery, it'll all be cool. Anybody wins a lottery this weekend, it's a big one on the Euro Millions, just think of Wildlife Aid and think that I could actually be nice to you for probably a year if you gave us lots and lots of money. It's all about money, Laura, it's all about money. <laughs> Catherine's studying illustration. Ah, illustrators, always useful. Do us some cartoons, illustrate some books, illustrate some of our work. Abby tries to draw, but she's not that good, sadly. She's trying. I always say all my staff are very trying. Or should I say they're trying? I can't remember. Keep going. <laughs> so MR Tog 2 has asked, have you ever rescued a harvest mouse? Um, personally, no. I'm, they come in sort of either with somebody or somebody goes out and gets them. We have dealt with harvest mice. We deal with all sorts of mice. We deal with anything. We are not species specific. If we can get it back and we can get it back out to the wild, that's what our work's all about. So it doesn't matter what it is, we'll try and do it. Little child once, about five years old, brought in an earthworm that her dad had cut in half with a spade. We looked after it best we could. Uh, so Lassigna02 has asked, where, um, how far away is, well, what's the most exotic patient you've ever had in? I've no idea. Well, I don't know. We deal with exotics as well. I mean, I suppose if you call exotics, exotics. I went out to rescue what I thought was a grass snake behind a fridge. The fridge was up on the thing. People wouldn't go near it. I turned the fridge around. It was about a 12 foot python. And I just looked at it and went, and I put the fridge on the floor, got a sack, and as one does, one just says to the python, I just want you in that sack, and I'll never believe it to this day, but it sort of looked at me, looked at the sack, and slithered into the sack. End of story. So simple when you don't know what you're doing. Cool. So Neville Ramstein has just asked, how do you cope with all the animal suffering that you see in this job? Huh. 
laugh, to be honest. I think doctors, vets, nurses have a very black, dark, sick sense of humour. My team will all tell you that I've got the sickest sense of humour in the world. You've got to get rid of it because it is so foul and so bad. And if you look at all the social media nowadays, you see all these videos all over the place. At the end of the day, you can, you've can you got to decide what you want to do and do your one bit. Yes, I'd love to be the cure-all for everything. I'd love to be, you know, I'd like to make it all well. I can't. I will concentrate on what I do well and I have to let others do their bits, but we do what we do well. I hate it. I mean, you know, sometimes I get very dark days and I just want to give it all up. But if I give it up, nobody will be rescuing or in this place won't work. So you keep on slogging, you keep on slogging until you've got no breath left. And knowing Laurie, he'll stamp on my chest that last time to get the last breath out of me. He's like that. Laurie's like that. He's mean. It's becoming more likely as this chat goes on. Go on, off you go. So Armpit Fuzz, which I love the name of. That's just not right. <laughs> has asked, Armpit Fuzz, what just is your not worst good. inflicted injury? I'm going to send you a Gillette razor. You know, this just isn't good. My worst self-inflicted injury or my worst injury? Your worst injury from an animal. Uh, probably, apart from badger bite of my thumb, it was when I got an antler there in my head when I was trying to rescue something. I couldn't see anything for the blood running down my face. I had no idea if I was badly hurt or not. Um, it hurt when it did it, and I just kept on. I finished the rescue, then I sat down, and actually I think my daughter was there. She said, you've got an awful lot of blood on your face. You look very pale. And I just said, does it look bad? And we wiped it off. It was nothing. It's peanuts. Um, I haven't got a brain, so it just went through into a hole in the middle of my skull, and it was great. Come on, Laurie, keep going. So Georgia has asked, uh, how can we help hedgehogs? By buying them Bacardi. Really important. That helps lots of hedgehogs. Send it care of me, and I'll send it on to the hedgehogs. Um, hedgehogs are really the biggest problem they have, particularly in the southeast, are their boundaries. They can't get from garden to garden. So we help them by giving them their wildlife corridors. So you just dig a little hole in your fence at the bottom, right at the bottom of the fence, not bigger than that. Then they can all trottle off and do their things. A hedgehog will often go at least two or three cricket, uh, cricket pitches, football pitches a night. So they've got quite a wide range of, of habitat. They need to find the right food. So have a wild patch in your garden, have wild plants, have stinging nettles, have all these sort of things that will attract the slugs and the snails and the beetles and all the blah, 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 blah things. Um, so, yeah, food supply in the autumn and spring, but don't put down too much dog food unless you really see they're struggling. They will find their food if you've got the right habitat there, the right plants in the garden, and enough of that type of thing, and give them their corridors because they need to get to do what they have to do in the spring. Hedgehogs can be naughty in the spring, and they can be naughty again in the summer when they do what they do. Personally, I wouldn't like to be a hedgehog. It would be a very painful experience, but we'll pass quickly on. So Kieran has asked, how many animals do we deal with in a year? We deal with 20,000 wildlife incidents. Um, it's very hard to split out what comes in, what doesn't. A lot of it, we've got so expert over the years. We've got an amazing team of receptionists who are ably led by Alice, who's an absolute loony nutcase. And without her, we would be in so much trouble. Um, she's, there's a book written by the vet team and Alice about what you can do, what you can help, what you can do to things. And often, if you give us a call first, unless it's a real emergency, we can actually keep that animal in the wild and get it back out. It doesn't need to come into us. But we deal with over 20,000 incidents a year. So Heather is asking, how can you just go and pick up a swan? Are you not nervous? Nah, nah, pussycats, pussycats. Far more nervous when I was sitting on the back of a crocodile in Belize. Then I was nervous. Then I was really, really scared. Um, it's a 14 foot crocodile and the chap got off the front forgetting that I was sitting on the back half and the crocodile sort of made its way back to the water and I was sitting on the back thinking, I'm gonna die. I didn't. Um, no, I'm not nervous now. First time I was, when I did my first rescue, I'd never rescued anything before. Um, but I think the most important lesson I learned on that very first rescue is an animal will know if you're scared of it or nervous of it and it will play up to it. If it thinks you're not nervous, whether you give off a different scent or whatever, it will be far more compliant. Um, I like to think that's gonna help my media team, but it doesn't, so I just shout at them a lot. On Come on, note. keep going, keep going. So D. Godfrey has asked, what qualifications do you need to volunteer at Wildlife Aid? Insanity is the only qualification you need. Um, dedication. No qualifications, don't care what you know. It's what you feel in your heart. 
it's your ability to somehow interface with the animal you're dealing with and do it in the right way. Sometimes you can go blasting along making noise, but most of the time it's quietly, softly, gently. And you get you see some of our rescues we've done when we try to get ducklings and ducklings and parents. Sometimes you can just move half an inch and it'll scare it. So you step back half an inch and just slowly, slowly. So qualifications, insanity. So uh, we've got a number of people asking, what ever happened to Sarah? Sarah was with us again for some years. I tend to, I tend to sort of kill off vet nurses after five years. They can't work with me any more anymore. They sort of come in and work and I drive them nuts and they leave. Um, Sarah left us, went to another wildlife centre and then went on from then. This was some years ago now. We're probably talking about 10 years ago, I guess. Yeah. Long time ago. God, I'm so old. <laughs> uh, we've got a few people that are surprised that you can sing. <laughs> well, you know, you know, really, it seems not particularly an art. I can do all sorts of voices too. Um, I used to be a singer, I used to do a bit of music, I used to play my own trumpet, and that's actually quite literally I did. Um, I was going to make music in my career, I was going to play in the West End shows, play the trumpet, loved it. Come and practice the trumpet for about 30 years. Um, but yeah, so I can sing a bit. I can hold a tune, as they say, but my daughter is the songstress in this family. She's got an album, she still writes music now, and if she got very successful writing music, then I might even get a pension out of it. So, you know, if anybody wants a song written, pay us lots of money, we'll write you a song. Simple. Lou gets the money, has to give it to Daddy. Daddy gets a pension. So simple. So Adam Rogers has asked, what is your opinion on the new legislation about grey squirrels in the UK? <laughs> um, it's my favourite word. It's insane. Um, whoever drafted the legislation or is drafting it now did not ask the right people what the downside could be. I think the downside could be absolutely phenomenal. I think it could take wildlife rehab underground. I think it could take wildlife or squirrel rehab into people's houses and then you get to other problems. You might feed them the wrong food. You're very likely to imprint them, which is a death sentence for them. Um, it needs looking at. We are fighting it with every fibre of our body. We've had so many meetings in the last two weeks about it. Um, whether we can win or not, I hope we can because I think it's badly thought out and they just haven't given it enough, enough thought. They haven't talked to the experts who could tell them what to do. We actually handle squirrels. The population is so huge that we probably see wildlife centres all over the UK see less than 0.1% of the population so what we do is going to make no difference, but basically um, the legislation is going to tell us that we have to euthanise squirrels when they come in. And for a vet and vet nurses and a team of dedicated people who spend every minute of their waking day trying to save wildlife, you're now telling them on that one, you have a nest of five baby squirrels, you've got to kill it. That is serious mind problems. I could say a word, but I'm not allowed to swear but that's going to blow people's mind out and it will be beyond vile. Let's get off this subject quick. So we've got a username that unfortunately I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, but the question is, what animals are the most difficult to handle during a rescue? Um, anything that bites you really, I suppose. Um, having said that, I was once slapped on the back by an iguana up a tree, but that's a whole nother story and that really hurts. They've got these sort of spiny things all down their tail and that really hurts. Um, Probably, a, a, not an elder deer, a mature deer, either a roe deer or a fallow deer, they've got big antlers and you've got to be careful. And I think the thing I have on rescues, which perhaps people don't realise, is when I'm going out with a team of people to do this, they can think about themselves and deal with what they're dealing with. But I've not only got to think about the animal, but I've got to think I don't really want to get a volunteer hurt unless they're very old and then if you just let them, you know, they don't matter anymore. But seriously, I have obviously health and safety in my head the whole time. I have a terror that one of our volunteers is going to get hurt. And if I'm in charge of this place, that's my fault and my conscience would be wrecked. So, yeah, it's probably an adult deer with antlers. So that would be the, the daddy deer to anybody who doesn't know. So Mario has said, uh, let's tear down all fences in the country to give wildlife less struggle and has wished you greetings from Switzerland and donated 50 Swiss francs. I love the Swiss franc. 
I love the Swiss. I love you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Switzerland's beautiful. I used to go and I was in my other life when I was a commodity broker. I used to go to Switzerland quite a bit. Love it. Beautiful, beautiful place. Um, yeah, we need to get... Human population has got to be slowed down. And it's a subject which I'm sure politicians just avoid like the plague because, you know, Attenborough said it, and rightly so. I've been saying it for years. We need to somehow not have so many people. We can't take keep taking the ground, we can't keep taking the land, we can't keep taking the habitat, and we need less people, guys, because there's going to be going to run out of food one day as well. Let's get off that subject, because that's another five-hour call. So, uh, Bumble Sivanax has asked, what's your favourite rescue video that we've uploaded to the channel? I have no idea. I will not look at myself on television. It scares the living day, daylight out of me. I don't even recognise myself now I'm so old. Um, I'm sure we've got some favourites. I mean, I did like the one when the swan was whacking me on the back and I was rescuing the signet. But they're all favourites for five minutes and then I'll do another rescue and that becomes the best rescue. I just love rescues. Um, you'll tell by the end of this, but I love rescues. Did I say that? I love rescues. <laughs> so a few people have asked, what age do you need to be to volunteer here? it will be 18. Um, and the only reason for that really is because of insurance. And to be honest, would I want a young child here when they could get hurt and I'd feel responsible for that as well? I mean, I do think of the volunteers' safety more. The only time I ever really shout at a volunteer is if they put themselves in a position where they're going to get hurt or they've done something really wrong to affect an animal. Otherwise, I'm a pussycat. But if that happens, I'm no longer a pussycat. I'm not a nice person. Because actually, I'm terrified for them. And it's my responsibility running this place to look after them as much as the animals. But as I say, the older ones, you know, people like Ron, who's been here for about 20 years, you know, he has got a lot of life left. Poor old chap. Um, ring him up any time of day or night, ask him to do a rescue and he's gone. I mean, actually, I can't afford to lose you, Ron, really. Don't, 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 don't leave us just yet. <laughs> so Skull has asked, how do you cope with handling snakes? Because you appear not to like them that much. Um, I suppose you get used to what you deal with. I deal with British wildlife mainly. We don't have a lot of snakes. The only snakes we have or we see predominantly are slow worms, which aren't a snake or grass snakes. We see the odd adder. I, don't, I just don't think they're cuddly. Sorry, guys. They're important. Don't get me wrong. Um, the python did nearly make me wet myself. Um, and when I was in Australia, when they asked me to pick up a, I think it was a copperhead or a copper something or other, but apparently it's the fourth most deadly snake in the world. Um, I remember picking it up and my cameraman pointed the camera in my face and said, what do you think of that? I had no saliva in my mouth at all. I thought, I'm glad. Um, yeah, I think you should be... I don't think you should be scared of animals. I think you should be very respectful of any animal, to be honest, whether it's vicious or not vicious. You should have respect. And I think if you have that respect, they actually seem to have respect for you as well. Sounds a bit crazy. It's all about sentience and it's all about senility. So, a uh, couple of people asked, do you have any pets? <laughs> yeah, I've got Laurie and I've got Abby. I knew that was coming. And I've got Alice. <laughs> No, I've got a couple of dogs. Um, uh, they were barking as we started this thing tonight and I was shouting at my crew to get them out there because as much as I love them, I really can't concentrate on them and, and what's going on here. I've got a golden retriever who's actually quite elderly and he's got cancer, so I'm a bit... Mm. Uh, it's not long before he's going to be here. He's 10 on the 1st of March, so wish him a happy birthday and send him £10 million for the new centre and he'll be very grateful. I'd probably be quite grateful too. And I've got a black flat coat retriever who is very beautiful. I call him the mammoth because I've never had a black flat coat quite as big as him. And he hasn't got a brain. Big heart, no brain, black flat coat retriever, disaster. I think he takes after me, actually. That's rather brilliant. Go on, keep cracking, Laurie. Uh, Denise has asked, when should you leave an animal and when should you intervene? Um, a lot of this, again, is down to feel. And it's some of it's down to experience. Um, that would be a very long answer. I'm not even going to give it. I'm quite happy to talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis about that, but it's not an easy answer. If that animal is going to survive by itself without you intervening, stay well clear. Uh, if it's not, then you've got to do something, whether it's a rescue release or getting it back and give it some medication. Um, you've got to feel it. Yeah, I know I will keep saying this, and heaven knows if anybody was going to be even more loony than I am, but you just get a sense of what you need to do and what you don't need to do, and it's very hard to explain. Uh, so we've had a couple of people asking, do you have a large crew with you for each rescue, or is it just you? It's all about me. 
and all the other 350 people that make me work. Um, no, when we're on a rescue, I don't want a big crew. Um, we've been offered quite a few different TV series where people will come in and film it, and I won't do it because when I'm on a rescue, I want to be focused. The animal comes first, and more than anything else, I don't want some idiot in the way with the camera when I'm trying to do something because I don't know where the animal's going to go. He doesn't know where it's going to go, and I want to be free to move. So whichever film crew we have, we normally take one people, one people, one people, I've, too much Bacardi. Um, we normally take one person, sometimes two, but I need them not only to keep out of my way, but they mustn't lose me because wherever I am, obviously the animal hopefully will be as well. And not only that, but we do quite a lot of training with them first so they understand where I'm coming from so I don't swear too much at them after about the first 10 years. Okay, uh, so Hazel is asking, what's the best way to treat a fox with mange? Can anything be done? Um, sorry, I'm just looking at something from Lucy Wildlife. So we transferred him into their care. Are you talking about me, Lucy? Do you transfer me into their care? That's Do I need to go beak. into care? That's Wonky Beak. Wonky Beak? Oh, that's yes, let's not talk about Wonky Beak. That'll really get me going. Oh, mm. Right, let us talk about... What do you ask me then? <laughs> Lloyd did so, that sign to me, which doesn't mean I'm either going to say something I shouldn't, I'm going on to a topic I shouldn't, so be very careful, Simon. So I'm being careful. So, Hazel has asked, what's the best way to treat a fox with mange, and can anything be done? Yes, um, a lot of senders in the old days said, oh, if you've got a fox with mange, you've got to kill it, mange is incurable. Well, we get mange, we get scabies, same thing as mange. We don't kill us if we get mange, perhaps we should. Um, two main treatments we use nowadays are Advocate, which is just a drop-on, which you give for dogs for their fleas and things. It's just two treatments over three weeks, and it works incredibly well. There is a pill which has escaped me totally at the moment, which is even better, but they're 35 quid a kick and it only needs one of those. Um, we did give one to Ricky Gervais's fox a while ago and the fox is looking so beautiful now, beautiful. So yeah, they're the two ways that we use mainly nowadays. A couple of people have asked, uh, what rescues are the most common here? I've no idea, I forget. Um, no rescue's common to me, it's always special. I suppose hedgehogs are quite common. They're getting silly places. In the springtime, it's fox cubs and hedgehogs in football nets. Different times of year, it's different types of things. In the summer, it's deer getting stuck in fences and fox getting stuck in fences. Um, most common are probably birds um, knocked out of trees, squirrels knocked out of trees, all this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I would be a hard one to answer. I'd have to sit and actually think. And I don't like using my brain this time of night. It's quite scary. So King Muffin has given King us Muffin, I like that name. And said, what's your most entertaining swan rescue? There's been thousands, to be honest. Um, one that was very funny, I suppose, going back quite a few years now, actually probably before Laurie was born. Yeah, that far back, I guess, um, was we had a, 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 a pen in trouble. Um, it had some fishing wire, or some fishing line around its foot, and as I was trying to get to the pen, the cob was coming across the lake from a big, it was a big, big lake, and this cob, cob just powered across the pond, right up, you know, wings up, everything up like that, and I just let him get closer and closer and closer, and everybody was going, oh, it's all going to go wrong, and I let him get within about 20 feet, I just said, stop, and he stopped. Again, it's the fear thing, it's the scare thing. I wasn't scared. And he looked at me and thought, oh dear, I'm not going to scare this guy. So he just stopped. He sat back in the water, just hissed a lot. Rather like somebody else I could mention, really. So, uh, WiddyQ91 has said, how do you deal with all the vomits, poo, wee, maggots, and everything else that people find nauseous? Funny, if somebody's sick, if a human is sick, I had to leave the room, and I'm quite likely to be sick as well. Um, if an animal's sick, or poos, or whatever, I mean, I've had badger poo in my mouth. Um, just a quick little story, because I know we're going to run out of time. We're going quite well at the moment, but very flat badger, no refactor. I just wanted to see what sort of temperature it was. So I put the thermometer up its bottom. Mistakenly, I had my head at badger bottom height, and when I pull the thermometer out, yeah, I cut And then another rescue was a fox, which is up about six foot high on a shelf in a shed, and he was very scared, and I was trying to get the grasper up to grab him. And I grabbed him, I was ever so pleased with myself, and then he peed all over my face. And I was choking to death, it was pretty vile. But in general, I don't mind poo. 
poo, pus, whatever, I say, bad sense of humour, funny sense of humour. I just like seeing it go on other people rather than me, really. I'm just waiting for Laurie to get a good dose of vomit. Thank you very much. Um, so Legola has actually donated 70 US dollars and has said, and I quote, F it, I don't need to eat this week. But you, do you need to eat? Because then you haven't got enough strength to go and earn some more money to give us some more money later. 70 dollars, strength of the dollar at the moment, it's pretty good. Sterling's not doing very well. So again, huge thanks to everybody. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a dollar or a million pounds. Well, it does really, but you know what I mean. It's the thought. It's all about the thought. It's all about the animals. Whatever you can afford to give would be great. As I say, always say, legacies are the most vital thing of ever, but they're always the hardest thing to talk about. Um, I think the thing I find hard about legacies is you get a big legacy come in and you can never say thank you to the people because obviously by the time you get it, they're not here anymore. So it would be absolutely amazing if people would tell us they're going to donate and you could at least ring them up and say thank you. It just means the world to us. It makes all the difference. And it will turn a small charity into a medium charity and a medium charity into a big charity. So, yeah, every, every buck counts every dollar counts every euro counts every everything counts thank you so on that topic uh useless at usernames has said a huge thank you to simon and the wild fa team and she's very kindly made wild fa the beneficiary in her legacy i love it see i can say thank you and that is really great i mean if you want to give me a ring and have a chat sometime that would be great as well because it's just so nice to say thank you um if it's a huge amount of money please let me get Laurie in the room first because he's got a defibrillator because it could quite likely kill me. But it is great. The only reason they put, they only, we only bought this defibrillator last year and I'm sure they actually did it very quietly because they think I'm going to die. Now, everybody else is young here and they obviously, the old man might carp at any time. We'd better get one of these in. But then, you know, I have to think about receiving mouth to mouth from Laurie. It doesn't sit well in my head. Guys, thank you. Makes a difference. Money always helps us. So, a number of people are asking how they can donate in, um, whether it's done by the website or YouTube, can we accept currencies all around the world? Well, here we are, look, we're going to get Laurie in next to me now because he knows all the answers to this and I don't. Laurie, come in. I know you're ugly, but I just want them to see how handsome I am compared to your ugliness. This is so, not... Laurie, Laurie's going to tell you how you can donate to Wildlife Aid. I actually Hi. say always put it in Simon's bank account, but nobody ever does that. Laurie, you're on. I didn't intend to be on the stream. Uh, so donation-wise, we have a number of different platforms set up. Obviously, YouTube is fa um, is great for us. We've got the live stream running now, and people have been incredibly generous. Uh, on our website, we have PayPal and direct debit donations set up. We do accept donations from all around the world. Everything just gets converted into pounds by your bank for us. Uh, so that's absolutely fine. And Text. Text. text donations text so it's text wild five or wild ten to seven oh three hundred to give five or ten pounds as one off and to seven oh five hundred to give it as a monthly donation uh, unfortunately that is uk only so the only thing um that we can do for a broad shop is the online paypal or anything like that we can send checks we do get checks through as well uh anyway any way you can think of, we probably accept it. And if not, please send us an email and we'll try and work something out. Right, you can go now. Go, Laurie. Thank you. I'm the star here. Not him. Not him. He's actually getting best, better at rescuing than I am. He's getting very embarrassing. I might have to fire him soon. Right, give us another question, guys. Uh, so, uh, Josh Strawberry Laces has asked, how many hedgehogs can you keep at the centre at any one time? Uh, we have capacity to keep up to about 400 hedgehogs if we had to. We've never got to that level. We did double our facility last year. This is always the unknown because last year we got over 200 and we ran out of space. So this year, or oh, last year need is now, last autumn, I built an extra hedgehog shed because I thought, by heavens, we're going to be full. And I think we overwintered about 50. So you never know. You never know. But all our facilities are, are multi-purpose full. So... One minute in one time of the year, there'd be hedgehogs in it, and there could be fox cubs in it, and there could be birds in it. Everything we've got is ambidextrous. Wrong word, but I like it. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of people that are saying that you're cute. Just throwing that out there. Those were the days, my friend. I thought they'd never end. Sorry, there's enough singing. Enough singing. If anybody wants to sign me, happy to do a song. Happy to make a million pounds because I'll put it into Wildlife Aid and build a new centre. Um, thank you. I'm a bit flattered and embarrassed, actually. <laughs> a bit uh, hot in so here. So, Lobster has said, 
Is Wildlife Aid only one centre, or is it more of a franchise? We've done this, been there, Laurie, been this, Lofty, you must have missed this. One place, one place. Would I want to run more than one place? No way! I would have a nervous breakdown. You have got to be joking. No, one place, but we do advise all over the UK, we advise to vets, we advise to people, and I've even had to advise internationally. We get calls from abroad about things, and because of all the contacts I've built up over the years, <coughs> we've got the most amazing network all over the world. So, one place, just me, very old, thank you. So Christian has asked, how many Volvos have you had, and how many miles do you put on them? Uh, I don't even know how many Volvos I've had, really. I had quite a few. Broken quite a few, curbed quite a few, blown a few tyres in quite a few. I think I've had about six Volvos from memory. We've got two at the moment. Um, one goes out on big rescues, which has got all the kit in it. Um, and then the other one is for sort of my, what I call my rapid response vehicle, um, which is nice and fast because I love cars. I love fast cars, shouldn't do really, should be environmentally friendly. I've got to have some vices, guys. I used to rally drive, love that, can't afford to do that anymore. So I just drive my Volvo every now and then, sometimes up a curb. <laughs> Big mistake, getting old guys, getting old. So, uh, some random cat has asked, do you think you'll be able to handle the US wildlife? Somebody just called me crazy. That's accurate. That's very, very unfair. Ni if you say nicely crazy, that's all right. Ask me the question again. <laughs> so, uh, some random cat has asked, do you think you'll be able to handle US wildlife? Yeah, handle the US wildlife. Been out to the US a few times filming. Um, I love it all. I, wherever I am, I love it. I think possibly the best, the, the reason why you get good at something is because when you start a centre like this, you're often dealing with the younger animals and the younger animals are the same species. So you begin to understand how the animal works, how it thinks, what it does, what it's likely to do. And I think if I was in Australia for some considerable time, you need to stand back and watch. The good the thing you've got to do is you've got to watch somebody who you trust, who you think is an expert, and you learn very quickly. You have to learn the animal. And I think by doing that, you know, and by tri doing the younger ones first, um, you learn very quickly how to handle it. I mean, we had one about two years ago, we had an otter in, an adult otter, and we'd never had one in before. And I thought, okay, never done an otter. I'm not quite sure how they handle what they're like. And uh, I thought, okay, well, it's going to be like a badger, big bite, really hurty, hurty. If you ever get bitten by an otter, you are going to go to A&E because it'll take a finger off whatever it gets hold of. Very painful. So I treated this otter rather like the badger. I put it in the back of one of our pens. Um, and badgers normally just go to the back and try to keep out the way. This otter, different type of mentality. It launched itself at me screaming. Um, and we still have got the footage of that. And the scream is pretty hideous. And I just shot out the back of this shed about 30 miles an hour, thinking, yeah, have a board in front of you next time, a bit safer. So you learn the animal, you've got to learn the animal, and obviously if you deal with them when they're youngsters, you begin to work out how they're going to be when they're adults as well. So DW Bro, who I like very much, has asked, why are you so mean to your staff? Because they love it. People here love me. You've got to understand, darlings. You've got to understand that people love me. And if I was nice to them, they'd think there was something wrong. I'm not really mean, I'm really not mean. Um, I won't even get Laurie to answer this while I'm still in the room, but I'm me. And if you don't like it, there's the door. Unless you're good at saving wildlife, and in Laurie's case, he's got a contract that is actually for infinity. He's not allowed to leave, he's not allowed to receive too much pay, and he's not allowed to leave. I mean, he's got all my passwords to all my, all my tech stuff. He's got my passwords. I'm absolutely lost without him. No, I'm not gonna admit that on camera. No. Off that. <laughs> Go on, keep going. Uh, so, a couple of people have been asking, is it just you that does the rescues, or is there a team of rescuers? There's a huge team. Um, I'm, I suppose it's a bit of boss, boss, what is it, boss benefits. I've done so many rescues over the years of all types that now I only go on the ones that are really difficult because I love it, that's my challenge. And obviously a difficult rescue, you, you get one, as I say, you get one chance. You can take people on you on the, with you on those rescues and they can learn, but it's all just feel. And so I do the more difficult ones because they're more challenging and I want to make sure that animal gets right. I don't care what people think about that. I want to get that animal back, so it's important to me. But if people start off on the not so dramatic things, they'll learn again, they'll learn how that animal behaves, how it works, 
uh, before they take over. If I get a very high tree rescue, um, knowledge or no knowledge, I don't go up trees anymore, far too old, far too scarce. I send Laurie. Quite simple, if he falls off, his fault. We've got all the ropes, we've got all the climbing gear, we've got all the kit. Does he ever use it? Does he poo poo? No. So, use that video. so if he falls off, then <laughs> that's his fault. Um, I can't do heights. I used to be fine on heights. Nowadays, I've only got to go up a ladder of sort of 10 foot high and my knees start to wobble. It is probably senile dementia. So at least I've forgotten it by tomorrow. So Classic Shive has said, Laurie, please cough twice if you're being held hostage. Please send someone. He's got me by the ankle. <laughs> I can't speak. They have given me no drugs. I can say nothing at this time. No, I'm fine, guys. I'm fine. I'm just me. You'll get used to me or you won't. Up to you. Give me an animal and I'm happy. That came out wrong. Didn't mean to say it like that. But you know what I mean, because you've now had me for about three quarters of an hour. You understand how my brain works. Animals come first. People come fifth, sixth or seventh. Um, so a couple of people have asked, what's the most common mistakes people make when they're trying to help wildlife? I think you can be, you can rush in too quickly. Again, I say always ring a centre like us first and just get some advice, providing it's not a dramatic situation. Um, so you sometimes rush in when you don't need to. Um, and sometimes if you are on a rescue, you get so into the rescue and you get so panically that you get flustered, you rush after something. Whereas if you just actually stood there very quietly, the animal might not have come to you, but it might just let you go to it. And if you run after it, it's gonna leg it. Animals have the three Fs. And you think this is going to be a swear word, it's not. It, the first one is to flee, the second one is to freeze, and the third one is to fight. And that fighting, they don't do it unless they really have to. They don't want to fight you. Um, so run if they can, freeze if they can't, and if they think their life's in danger, they will fight. And you can get a badger who's nearly on his death legs, just about to die. They will still find the energy to inflict some really nasty damage because they think you're going to kill them. They think you're going for it. They think their life's in danger, as you and I would, as Laurie so often does. Yes, uh, next one. A couple of people have asked, when is our open day this year? Don't ask me questions like that. I have staff. Um, I've forgotten what the date is. Laurie's going to tell 7th. me. July 7th. July the 7th. I'm away that week. <laughs> hey, open day. I have to be nice to people all day. Oh, oh. Um, July the 7th. We'll be here. Um, slightly different format this year, so I'm told. If it fails, if the new format fails, somebody will, heads will roll. And if it doesn't fail, we'll be there. I'll be signing books, probably two. Not famous anymore, lost the plot. Here I am, why have I fade? <laughs> uh, so Lobster has Lobster, asked, Lobster's been there. Have you ever rescued or tried to rescue a red deer? Yes. Uh, it wasn't a nice red deer because it had a gaping great wound and half its um, guts were hanging out, so it wasn't a good ending but they are big. I mean, I used to work on farms, I used to milk cows, I used to have to work with the beef stock, and they are big, and the red deer is big. So nowadays, now I'm old, I either send lorry, or I say that I'm sorry, I'm at the cinema. Never mind, somebody else can go. Um, yeah, we have. Uh, they're big, you have to be doubly careful, um, and then again, they won't let you get near them unless they're in big, big trouble, and if you do get near them, you've got to be really, really careful. Red deer would take quite a few people unless you're doing the, the PTS route, which sometimes is sadly the only way. We hate PTSing, we do it all too often. Um, this last month I've probably had to shoot probably four or five, maybe more deer, and that's the downside of our work. But we're there to stop animal suffering, and if that animal can never go back to the wild, whatever you do to it, um, I would rather it go to heaven than be stuck in a cage for the rest of its life. We've got a very strict ethos here. We're probably one of the strictest ethos centre in, in the UK, certainly maybe in the world, but I believe an animal, a wild animal, should be in the wild, and I believe most people should be in cages. Did I say, say that? So, having just made Abby choke on her drink, um, the next question is, are we species specific? Do we rescue things like pigeons, rats, and things that other people might not be particularly fond of? I've answered this earlier as well. We are not species specific. We will, uh, never will be species specific. Um, we will do what we can for any wild animal that comes in. And we even sometimes have to deal with exotics, which aren't British wildlife because nobody else will go. Um, it doesn't happen so much now, but it can happen. So no, we are not species specific. Uh, a couple of people are asking, do we accept work experience? 
We do. Um, that's something you have to apply for on the on the online on the website. Um, there's certain criteria to it. You have to be a certain age again because of the insurance. But that's Alice's domain, um, and she can be scary. Not very often, but she can be scary sometimes. Um, no, apply on the on the website. Ask the question on the website. We will get back to you. I mean, we get hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. We try to power through them as quickly as we can. Um, so yeah, bear with us. It's not because we don't care. It's not that we don't like you. It's that we, we are always busy. We basically have five members of staff doing probably at least 15 people's work. So we're just insane and I'm just very mean because I won't employ anybody else. <laughs> a couple of people again asking, <coughs> do we have an Amazon wish list still? Yes, we do. I know that. I don't know what's on it. It changes all the time. We do have an Amazon wish list. I have one big problem with this, so here we go. I'm gonna, I know we've nearly done an hour now, and I was told I think I could only do an hour. But often people want to buy stuff off the wish list. They want to buy us dog food or cat food or something, which is wonderful, and I thank you. But I always get slightly twitchy because if somebody buys us from Amazon <coughs> six cans of dog food, for instance, we could actually, from our wholesalers, probably buy 12 cans of dog food for the same price. So it's all about money, guys, all about money. I will maximize what we get to the best of my ability. So. Give us DOSH, guys. Give us DOSH, and then we can buy what we want, when we want, and we can probably get it a lot cheaper than you can. I've nearly done my art. Are you going to kick me off this soon? I don't mind going all night, guys. You tell us. Let's see a few comments now. Who wants me to stop? Who wants me to go on? Come on, you can say there before Laurie just pulls the plug. He turns to do that on me. He does it on, 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 on my sort of heart machine occasionally when I get rowdy. He just pulls the plug out, and I go to sleep. No, we're here. I'm keeping arrested from this. I don't. I don't care. I don't care. A lot of people are saying keep going. A lot of people are saying keep a lot, going. A lot you must people. be mad. The Tom okay. Scott one has said you need more Bacardi. I wish. I'm actually. I'm nearly out of coke. It's really worrying me. I've only got that much left, so I'm not going to go for that much longer. In fact, there's a coke in the fridge. Adam, if you could be an absolute sweetie and get me a coke out of the little fridge in there, otherwise I should get very dry mouth. Um, I'm happy to do this far more often. If you want to do it once a month, whatever. Um, we will try and do it. The only thing I would say to you, uh, George, uh, George lost it. Uh, that George, that Canadian George, get off. Don't you come on to that like me, or I will tell them a few secrets about you, and I will tell a few secrets about, yeah, so you could be in trouble, George. You would be in trouble. Um, what was I talking about then? A <laughs> um, couple of people are saying, why do we use a, a gun with beer instead of using an injection <coughs> like normal? Um, okay, always a very, well, it's not difficult in my mind at all. The point is not difficult. I think a gun is kinder and quicker. So let's go through it. You have a deer that's going to have to be put to sleep. You pull the, you go up to it, no messing around, straight up, bang. As soon as you hear that bang, uh, could we please quiet the dogs before I kill someone? Thank you. Um, the, the second you hear that bang, the animal's dead brain dead without question. If you put a sleep a deer to sleep by injection, you've got to probably bring it into the center, you've got to shave its leg, you've got to raise a vein, you've got to get it all, all that takes time. I would much rather an animal be where it's living, out in the wild, looking at what it's looking at and then suddenly not be there, just like that, rather than drag it all through the stress of bring it into the center, or even if you're shaving it, you've got to shave its leg on site. To me, I want to do the quickest and best thing for that animal. I don't give a stuff about me. I want to do the best thing for the animal. And if I can put that animal to sleep in a microsecond to that animal, I'm sure it's the best thing. I know somebody's going to do it to me one day, and when it comes, it comes. This is why I never get, let Laurie get anywhere near my gun. Um, guys, when you feel all this is all finished and it's all gone down, let us know how often you'd like us to do this. I'm happy to do it as often as we can. But when we get into the busy season, which is, I mean, often season starts for us, probably in about a week, um, it's gonna get busy. We might find it a bit more difficult, but I promise you, if you want to ask questions, if you want to hear an old man making, sorry, I'm not weeing. Let me just do this on camera, otherwise everyone will think I'm having a wee at my chair. I'm really not, honestly. Um, we'll do it as much as we can. I love to impart our knowledge. I love to get you excited and passionate about wildlife because you might well go home tonight and rescue something, and that's one animal that will make the difference. Anybody ever th wonders how my head works, just Google a poem called Starfish uh, when we're off the air. That to me is my sort of philosophy. Starfish, Google it, have a look at it. 
tell me what you think. We have a video of you actually reciting that on the channel. Don't watch that. Yeah. Don't listen to me speaking. I'm a complete nutcase. I'm a, I can't speak well either. Well, I can speak quite well when I have to. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm nuts. I'm nuts. I don't care. I admit it. Um, yeah, okay, Laurie. Are we going or are we going to sign off and upset everybody? Uh, unfortunately, we need to sign off now. Oh. I've got to get back in my straight jacket. But at least I can have a Bacardi. <laughs> Honestly, guys, I can't thank you enough for supporting us. I would love to get our subscribers up to a million. We're sitting at about, here I've got 320,000 at the moment. Um, it'd be so great to get to that million mark because that means to me not only that you care about what we do, you like what we do, but it means that the word will spread and more people will understand the importance of having a food chain that works and having habitat for animals and not mankind just riding roughshod over everybody because they don't care. What we do is a little tiny bit to help the world and if you do all your little tiny bits as well, we can make a big difference. Watch out for something called IDOT. It's coming to your town soon. Uh, so for, for everyone who's still got questions, sorry we couldn't get to them in this one, but we will be doing another one of these, so please keep them coming and hopefully we can answer them in the next one. Goodbye, goodbye, it's time to say goodbye, goodbye. I've gone, that's it, bye.